if you're in a city, you're more than likely going to have to pre-treat that water before it goes into the city sewer system. So make note of that. That's something you're going to have to look at. Uh, I know there's a group of questions on here. Uh, let me open this up. Uh, I'm going to read the question. Uh, we're looking to do a feasibility study to see if the plan is viable prior to investment. Uh, do I have any referrals or qualified people to do the feasibility study? Um, I do not have uh, that in my backyard necessarily, uh, but I know the Intertribal Ag Council as well as Janie Hip could potentially have some suggestions there. Um, and there are some, uh, I, know, I know Janie and Zach have had groups to help writing these feasibility plans, so I do want to probably let those groups answer that particular question. And I see Janie. <laughs> um, <laughs> so one of the things I wanna share with you all is uh, you're gonna need to get really acquainted with your numbers. <laughs> and uh, if you're already doing some uh, production capacities, uh, you likely already have good control of your numbers. If you're already taking any of your animals to far processing somewhere else, like Chris, you all did, you, you had a good sense of your numbers. Um, but it always is a good thing to actually scope out where you physically are and where your potential customers could come from. And I know um, getting a good handle on that is, is really a, an important step um, because very few tribes, in my opinion, can actually uh, fully support just with their own animals a 24-7, 365 plant. I mean, maybe some can, but it's always better to have somebody else's animals in the mix, so you need to know going into it um, where they are, and there's all sorts of resources for that. Um, I've got a Rolodex that I'm happy to turn over to people, <laughs> um, and um, it's just the, you know, your market analysis and your and really tracking down where animals are in your region is going to be really important to your short, mid and long-term business plan. Sure. And, and part, you know, for our facility, we have customers that travel from approximately four hours radius of our plant. So we're in far Northeast Oklahoma. We have customers that come from Kansas, Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and some from Texas. So, you know, processing plants are in high demand, uh, in our area, there's never a, sh uh, never a shortage of business for the processing plants, especially since COVID had hit. We, we went from being booked out 60 to 90 days to being booked out through next spring, and we literally just stopped taking reservations because it just didn't make much sense to be reserving spots a year out. So another quick question I had to uh, see is, uh, is this a for-profit or a not-for-profit business? I would like to tell you it's for profit, but uh, this is a very tough business. They're very low margin business. Um, a lot of the plants uh, are for profit. Um, ours is set up for profit necessarily, but it is still a tribal entity. Um, we, we create a lot of jobs and we provide a lot of good services. Our facility, we use it for education purposes. We do a lot of internships in our facility, a lot of different things to help with offset our labor even. So there's a lot of reasons uh, that you wanna look at your plant and how you wanna set that up. If you think you're gonna be a millionaire off of running a processing plant, you need to take that out of your head immediately because it's not gonna happen. Um, these processing plants all across the country are very low margin uh, businesses. So, uh, but what you can do is stabilize your food supply and add food security to your tribe and to your community by having this facility in place. You can give your farmers and ranchers in your area uh, a place to retain their animals longer. And, and you know the value added programs are just exponential. So whether you're keeping your wean calves through processing and then you're taking your processed meat, turning it into other products all the way through smoking and cooking of products so that you can retail every single pound of that animal. Nobody wants to have, uh, you know, thousands of pounds of meat in their freezer. You know, you want to maintain a steady inventory. Thankfully, when COVID hit, we did have a fairly steady supply of inventory in our freezers. 
Um, you know, we, we would on average sell around 5,000 pounds a month of, uh, of meat, of, of the Quapaw Cattle Company meat that we have. Um, during the COVID pandemic, when store shelves were empty, we were selling in excess of 15,000 pounds a month of meat. And thankfully, we had that to, to be able to sell. Uh, today, our supplies are short. Um, we don't have near the stock that we did prior to COVID. So, but we were able to regulate our slaughters in our facility so that we could maintain the food supply in our community. That's probably one of the single best things that's happened to us uh, since the processing plant opened was even though our community grocery stores were out of meat, we never ran out of meat. We were able to take some of our animals that were either waiting for slaughter. We can always manage our slaughters by the demand. So when the uh, increase in demand rose, we were able to harvest more animals to keep meat in the supply chain. So there were, there were weeks that we did kind of ration the amount of meat that we allowed people to buy because there was a lot of panic buying. You know, we had individuals coming in wanting to buy 100 or 200, 300 pounds of meat. So we did have to limit that. Some, some weeks, some days, we limited it to 20 pounds per person, which is still a fairly steady number, uh, way better than what some of the grocery stores were doing by limiting one or two packs. So if you can kind of control your supply and so control your food chain a little bit more, obviously our, our community was, uh, uh, we didn't run out of meat. We were, we were secure. And, and by having that plant in place and running and operational allowed us to be more secure in our area. So it's something we've been fighting for for years, not only through food distributions, you know, obviously gardening, greenhouses, we have our own coffee. Uh, you know, we've been working on food you security have... for, for several years. So, you know, the processing plant obviously is one uh, component of our food security system that we've been working on. We also have been working on canning, uh, dehydrating foods, um, uh, freeze drying, lots of different, and, and, and from, from help, through help of grants that we've received, we're able to take our interns we got videos coming out online every week on preparation of food, preservation of food. So not, not just meat processing, but canning. We did a, a can a video on corn canning two weeks ago. We did one on pickle canning yesterday. So, you know, uh, you know, these things are available. We have canning equipment that we loan out. Uh, we have vacuum bag, vacuum sealers that we loan out. We have food dehydrators we loan out. So, Food security is a huge issue for everybody. I know you all are feeling it. So uh, we're getting a lot more questions on here. Uh, let me hit one more uh, before I go on down through my, uh, my, my list here. This is how much process development went into going from state certification to USDA certification. Well, USDA uh, is state or federal, it depends on which path you choose, but we never did go for state certification. We started from day one with FSIS uh, on the federal level. So we never did uh, start out as a state facility. I'm gonna go on down through my uh, list here uh, for site work, uh, some things you need to think about. A couple of things you need to think about are geotechnical work. Once you've identified the site, looked at the utilities that you have available, uh, you have to think about geotechnical surveys that need to be done. Sometimes they have to come out and do test bores to see what kind of soil you're in. Um, and that's also uh, compatible with your sewer testing to figure out if you're gonna put in septic systems or maybe some holding and settling ponds, things like that. That geotechnical work will help identify what kind of foundations you need for your building uh, as well as uh, with your utility systems. Um, if you're doing any grants, uh, sometimes on the feasibility studies, you'll be looking at an environmental impact survey, uh, looking at what items might be in that area. It could be from birds, uh, insects, um, water runoff. All these things come into play when you're looking at a, at a site selection and site design. Um, I mentioned some holding ponds and sediment ponds. We are in a rural area, uh, so we have a we do not run our sewer water or gray water into the city system. They would not allow it. 
Uh, we were a few miles from our city uh, sewer system as well, so it made sense to come up with a uh, on-site uh, sewer system and runoff collection system. So we do have a combination of septic systems and gray water collection that we'll, we have uh, holding ponds and settling ponds that we use. We also use some uh, air driven windmills to provide aeration in these ponds. We also have some mass surface areas. Uh, we do some uh, UV cleansing of the water before it's uh, field applied on our own property. So we're very careful in the design process to make sure we're not discharging any type of pollutants into uh, any streams or waterways. Uh, my next set of questions for you to think about is what kind of work will be done in this plant? Uh, you have to think about what you're going to do in the building. Uh, and that, that goes all the way into the design of the facility. Are you going to harvest animals? Not everyone is interested in harvesting animals. So if you want to just order in box meat product from an outside plant, you can. And then you can break that down. You can cook it, you can uh, you know, further process that, do added value, jerky sticks, all those kind of things. You can do that in a standalone facility as well. Our plant goes from harvesting on one end of the building all the way through further processing and added value on the other end of the building. So we wanted to build, we wanted to build our facility to do harvest, fabrication, we do dry aging in our facility. We have smokers in our facility so that we can make meat sticks, jerkies, hams, bacons. We have packaging equipment so that we can do uh, retail packaging and sell in the grocery stores. Um, we, do, we wanted to do everything that we were paying somebody to do. So that's why we built our facility the way we did. Uh, but you have to think about that and think about, because everything you do in that facility is gonna require space and equipment. Uh, and that breaks down into uh, answers that, that help you figure out your water, power, sewer, uh, and runoff. Uh, so if you're doing harvesting, you have to think about what you're going to do with the blood, what you're going to do with the uh, offall of the animal, what you're going to do with the hides, the heads. Um, you have to think about all these things. But to continue on that, um, if you are going to do harvesting of animals in that facility, what species are you going to do? And I think this will answer a couple other questions I see that have popped up. If you're going to do beef, if you're going to do bison, uh, if you want to do elk, uh, if you want to do sheep, goat, pig, uh, I see a question on there about deer. Uh, deer uh, are treated differently than your uh, beef and bison. So uh, I see a question about can you do those together? You cannot do those together at the same time. Uh, if you're going to do uh, deer uh, or, or even wild boar, that's treated differently as well. But deer have to be completely separated from your beef and bison and pork. Um, so you'll need to have separate coolers if you want to do them at the same time, or you'll do a complete plant wash down and clean up before you allow deer into your facility. So a lot of rules and planning has to go into place, but you cannot mix them at the same time. Uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, planning that goes into your HACCP plan, uh, but that's a whole nother uh, can of worms that you'll get into when you start writing plans and food safety procedures. Uh, Janie, you want to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to add briefly that um, if you think about it, uh, the wild game issue always comes up and it is possible you can be uh, inspected and approved as a multi-species, but it's back to what Chris was saying. You, you have to set up the plant to be operational to do it separately. Um, and the law, the federal laws are pretty clear about that. There's really no getting around it. Um, but if, but it's possible, um, to, to, you know, set it, segregate your plant and, and, or do a complete wash down, but the, you can get closed down in a heartbeat if you try to mix the two you got to just think about it in terms of your calendar and when you do what. I hope yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, you know, and separation can be space and or time. You know, uh, so Janie mentioned, you know, the, you can do different days, you can do different months, you can do different whatever, but, you know, some people in rural America, they like to shut down and do only deer during deer season. So, but that, what that means is they take every other species out of that plant for, 
for that period and then they reintroduce those other species after deer season's over. That is a possibility. You just have to build that in your plans and build that in your plant planning. So. Well, and Chris, it rolls back into your equipment selections too. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> pigs require different equipment than bison and don't yeah. even think about putting the two-legged, the chickens in that plant. <laughs> I was going to bring totally that up. I, a, <laughs> I did have a customer last week that brought that up. Uh, and the, there is a facility that uh, is in planning right now, you know, for they're going to, they want to do poultry and they want to do red meat, but they will be done on separate sides of the building. They will be separated and they will be two separate operations, potentially under the same roof, but completely separated. So like Jenny mentioned, things can be done. Uh, you just have to plan for it, plan it in your construction and in your food safety plans. So once you decide how many types of species you want to have, and I'll tell you real quick, our facility is licensed for beef, bison, pork, elk, sheep, goat, yeah, five different species. So uh, we do not do deer in our facility. We do not do wild boar. We do not do poultry. So, and, and we, we don't really want to. So uh, the next thing you have to determine after you figure out what type of species you want to do, you want to figure out how many you want to do. If you want to do five a week, that's going to determine what kind of space, cooler size you need from your drip cooler to your hang cooler. If you want to do 100 per week, that, that will obviously grow your space needs. If you want to do multi-species the same day, uh, if you want to do 20 pigs and 20, 20 beef the same day, you need to be able to keep those separated by space so your coolers are going to be big enough to hold all those animals. Uh, and then you're going to need to be able to have space to break those animals down uh, after they go through their hang period. Each animal may have a different hang period uh, for the type of species. So that can also help determine what size your coolers need to be. If you are going to process beef and you want those beef to hang for 14 days, that means they're going to be harvested and then go into a hang cooler for 14 days. So you need to plan how many animals you're going to kill a day, how long they're going to hang, and then th before they move into the fabrication and packaging process. Your pork, if you're going to do pork, your pork may not hang as long. So when you're thinking about harvesting pork, they may only hang a couple days and be moved into fabrication and packaging. But the, the bottleneck with pork becomes once you harvest them, hang them, fabricate them, then most people want to take the hams and bellies off of that pork and cure it and smoke it. So that's a whole nother operation if you're going to choose to do that. If you choose to do any curing and smoking, that's more room you need, more equipment you need, more power you need, more everything you need. So please make a list of all these different things that you want to do. So it's the very first thing you have to do. But, and I know we may have some architects on the phone as well, but we have to make sure that but when, before we go to a group of designers and architects that we are able to tell them what we want to do in our buildings. I know a lot of you already do development. You may have office buildings or homes or casinos or hotels or whatever, but you're at least, you have to be able to give these designers a list of things that you're going to do in that building. And when it comes to animals, you have to be able to tell them how many you're going to put in that building at one time or how many you're going to do in, in each week. So a lot of things to think about there. So um, I, Janie and I have both had it already where people are ready to break ground or at least they think they're ready to break ground. They call, they want to see our floor plan, and they're going to start moving some dirt. Um, time out. You've got to think about what you're going to do. And so if you want to replicate our facility, that's great. You know, uh, you got to think about all the other things that go along with it. So we're here to help educate you and share our information so that you don't just go build something that you're not going to use. Um, so... Again, take our information for what it's worth, and if you need more, we'll try to help you get more. Um, on down my list, uh, cutting and packaging. 
Uh, there's a lot of different types of equipment you can get. Uh, if you want to cut up and only supply restaurants, that'll be a certain type of equipment. You need a bandsaw, you need some uh, vacuum packing uh, equipment that will basically do institutional type packaging or primals. Uh, if your customer base is going to be a restaurant, a casino, or if it's going to be retail packaging, each one of those can be a different machine that you have to look at. If you're gonna do retail packaging, most people that sell retail want to have nice, neat, small packages with nice, pretty labels on them so that they look nice when they're sitting on a store shelf. If you want all of that, you just have to plan for it. It's all achievable, but I can tell you it all takes a different piece of equipment, which for each piece of equipment, it takes space. And then in that space, you need to plan for drains, water, power. Some of this equipment requires compressed air. Uh, you need an air compressor. You need an air dryer to dry that compressed air before you shove it into a $100,000 piece of equipment. Because if you shove damp air into that equipment, you're gonna burn it up. Um, so again, it's all a thought process you need to think through to make sure that you're designing your facility to do what you want it to do. Next item on my list is uh, uh, dry aging. Do you want to dry it? Do you have a steakhouse? Uh, this is something that we did because we have a prime steakhouse that we want to be able to sell our beef in. Um, we can do some non-aged product. You can do bag aged. If you're going to do bag aging of your product, you can literally put it in a normal cooler, let it age, move it however you want to move it. If you want to do dry age product, it takes a separate cooler to be able to do that. Um, so that product, you again, you have to figure out how long you're going to age it and then how that gets broken down in packages once it is aged. Are you going to do any smoking, curing, tumbling, grinding, stuffing, portioning, patties, links, any of these things? If any of, the, any of those uh, terms uh, caught your attention, every one of those is a different piece of equipment. So uh, if you wanna make bratwurst, that takes a piece of equipment. Uh, you have to have stuffing machines. Uh, portioning machines actually um, portion out your ground products so that you can control the quality and the size of the products. If you have restaurants that, that, that use pre-made hamburger patties, that takes a machine. Um, so again, Think through every, every potential customer you have or supply that you're going to be trying to supply and then make a list of that. And we can help you if you want, but we can, uh, but you have to think about that before you can even design a building and know how big of a building you need. Um, refrigeration, that's a big one. Um, you, you have to have refrigeration. You've gotta be able to chill down your carcasses after you harvest them. You've got to be able to have a place to hang them, uh, basically for aging, or uh, uh, you've got to have rooms that are climatized. You have to have product coolers. Um, and as you're thinking through how big of these spaces need to be, you've got to think about what you're going to do, how much product you're going to have in that building at one time. Um, so a lot of things to think about. You also have to think about if you want to purchase prefabricated cooling units, such as prefabricated walk-in coolers, prefabricated freezers, or do you want to build those? We did a combination. A lot of ours we built ourselves. Um, we, 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 we framed up walls, we poured concrete, put steel beams in, and then we put foam insulation all around them just to, big, to build like a big cooler. Um, and that saved us from having to buy prefabricated systems and then build structural systems inside of them. So uh, a lot of things to think about, but Structural engineers can help you figure out some of that loading and costing uh, to help you determine some of those decisions. Rail systems. The rail system is what the carcass hangs on after it's been harvested. Uh, the animal will typically get hung on a rail once it's harvested, and then it goes through the facility on that rail system until it gets cut up and put in a pack. Uh, there are a few different types of rail systems. You can have an automatic system that is chain driven, that you hit a button and it pulls these carcasses along, or you can have a manual system that a person will actually push that carcass in and out of the cooler. So again, something to think about, uh, and you have to know that as you're designing a facility. 
Um, the harvest room equipment, once you figure out what all you're going to do, what species you're going to do, you have to actually start identifying the type of equipment that you want to put in there. Some equipment requires air, some equipment requires water, a lot of it requires power. You need to know the voltages of each type of equipment. Um, you have to know all the specifics of the equipment and in some cases before you pour the concrete slab you're going to have to rough items in the concrete such as drains, um, conduits for power, uh, could be a multitude of things. Some of them might require um, you know, a, a structural support to be cast in the concrete as well. So it really helps to have the equipment identified and that can save you from having rework after the building is built. The pin systems that uh, you want to have, you want to hold your animals in. Uh, again, once you know what species you're trying to hold in the pen, then you can design your pin systems but you need to design your pin system before you pour any concrete in case you need to put any drains in, any water supplies. Uh, if you have to hold animals overnight, you have to give them water. Um, you need to have water and drains planned in there before you pour concrete. You may need to set some steel posts uh, in the ground before you pour concrete. Again, something else to think about, but you have to figure all this stuff out before you can pour concrete. Um, your fabrication equipment is very similar to all the other rooms. If you're needing a bandsaw, uh, if you're needing packaging equipment, uh, if you need labeling equipment, scales, uh, anything like that, you need to have that selected so that you can determine what uh, utility requirements you have. Cooking equipment, if you're going to do fully cooked product, are you going to have smokers, ovens, do you need hoods at that equipment? And by hoods, it's similar to a kitchen you might have where you need to get that exhaust out of the building. Uh, you need to select those processes, select the equipment, again, so you know the utility load and you know what's gonna be hung in that facility. Um, again, I'm just going down my list of grinding, stuffing, packaging, smoking, determine all your equipment needs. Uh, but before you can do that, you have to figure out what you're doing in that building. Are you gonna make any jerky, snack sticks, uh, bacons? Uh, if you're processing your own animals, I'll give you more to think about, but if you are gonna process your own beef, you want to make sure that you're using all of that product. You don't wanna have, you know, kill 10 animals and then end up having a thousand pounds of roast beef product sitting there that you can't sell. By having some type of uh, capacity to do further processing and added value, you can always take those products that are not as popular and turn them into something else. You can grind them and make meat sticks, which are shelf stable. Uh, they're great for backpack programs. Uh, they're great for food banks. You can, you can fully cook some fully smoked products that allow you to give out ready to eat meals. They can just, what they call heat and eat. You can heat these products up, uh, ship them out in a vacuum pack and have them ready to, to, to ship out. So again, if they're your animals, you really want to think about where that product is going and where it's going to end up uh, as you're designing this plan. Uh, you don't want to get hung with a bunch of product that uh, you don't know what you're going to do with. Hey, Chris, uh, getting down a, the, yes, sir. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I have a couple of questions here that I think tie together really well. So discussing uh, the implications for job career development associated with your processing facility, you know, just in the realm of rural community job development um, impact potential. Um, sure. How many staff members are required to run a facility of your scale? And if you don't well, mind that, sharing some of the numbers in terms of the operating budget and you know so on and so forth. Sure, sure, I'll tell you. I mean, from our facility, uh, we opened our facility in 2017 with about seven employees. Today, we're around 22 to 25, depending on the day. Uh, we do have some interns. We try to get as much free labor as we can. Uh, our, inter our local intertribal council that we have has some scholarship programs for high school kids. So we were able to bring in about three kids a summer. We have uh, some, we had some uh, grants that came in this year for college students uh, that were focusing in agriculture. 
So we currently have about four interns that we rotate through all of our ag programs. So that, that all goes into play, but you know, determining what your cost to operate the facility is completely depends on what all you're gonna do in that facility. Are you only gonna harvest and package or are you gonna run everything through uh, smoking, curing, everything? Our cost per month right now on staffing, our complete overhead cost monthly is about $100,000 a month. Uh, so that's a cost you can't take lightly. Um, and that's with the staff in the low 20s out on average typically. So, you know, it's a pretty good investment every month. And about 90% of our business that runs through that plant is outside customers. So. I think that answers a few questions there, but you know, from a trade standpoint, meat cutters are in short supply everywhere. Um, we work with a lot of colleges, universities, trade schools. Uh, there's a lot of groups that are trying to put certificate programs together and they're in the early stages. There are not many meat cutting schools available out there. Uh, we have a few locally that are starting some certificate programs, but we don't know how many are gonna sign up yet. Uh, we don't know if those schools are going to be uh, full or if they're going to be lucky to find any students. Uh, but uh, severe manpower shortages nationwide for meat cutters. It's, it's terrible. Uh, Janie and I talk about it uh, a lot on different calls, but there's a lot of groups out there working on different uh, uh, options for maybe coming up with some scholarship programs, trying to find, find young folks on reservations that maybe want to go learn the trade. Uh, maybe we can send them to a plant uh, and let them learn that trade for six months or a year and then let them go back and, and help their tribe get established or help, help their local area. But uh, staffing is a huge problem and something that really needs to be thought about in your region that you're in. So, that Great. Kind of that one? Yeah, I think it does very well and that takes care of a handful of questions that all were very similar in terms of the context. Yes. So thank you for sharing that. Um, another sure. question that I think is uh, fairly important, uh, and a lot of people are asking this too, is if there's any recommendations for any regional or national level consultation firms who specialize in processing facility development, who also, more importantly, have experience uh, doing this in Indian country. Right. You know, we, we didn't find a lot. We Fortunately, that's my background is building and construction, and I was able to put the folks together that we needed to make things happen in our area. There are very few, there's, there are so few processing plants at this level that the expertise is, is few and far between. So there are some, there are some groups that are trying to get up to speed, but the biggest thing you can do is find a good partner that you trust and that's honest and will help you navigate the waters but you have to answer these questions that I'm giving you today or they will not have a place to start. We had some good civil engineers that we worked with. Um, you know, the Intertribal Ag Council as well as the Native Ag Fund, the Intertribal Bison Council, all these groups are available to help you get the resources you need. Um, you need, I'm sure a lot of you have good uh, civil engineers you work with. We use civil engineers all the time for all kinds of things. But, uh, you know, a good structural engineer, and that's some of my next items here is, will you need a structural mechanical engineer? In a lot of, in most cases you will, but it's up to you to determine at what level you need them. Uh, if you decide to build a steel building and do a pre-engineered steel building, you can take bids on that particular steel building and that building supplier will do the structural design of the building itself. And you'll still have to hire one to do the foundations, but that's fairly common. That's not anything that's too crazy to figure out. But unless, until you know what equipment's going in that building, you have to make all that work with the footings, the foundations, any support walls you might need, any structural supports you might need for a rail system. So think this through is if you have all of these carcasses hanging on a rail, all of that weight is hanging down off of some type of rail assembly that needs to be designed by a structural engineer. So if you're gonna hang 100,000 pounds of meat off of a rail, you're gonna want a structural engineer to design that for you. And the first thing that structural engineer is gonna ask you for is a geotechnical report to tell him what kind of dirt 
that that structure is going to be sitting on. Last, they don't want to they don't want to design a structure that's going to be sitting in quicksand, so to speak. So you know, again, it's another process to think through. A mechanical electrical engineer. Um, when we built our facility, we hired our mechanical and electrical subcontractors as design build contractors, but we already had our equipment selected. We literally were able to take a manual and a floor plan and we marked everywhere that every piece of equipment was going to go and we had a cut sheet available for that piece of equipment that told that company what was going there and what it needed. So they were able to take that information, uh, water, power, air, drains, all that kind of stuff, and design that system on a design build basis. If you want to hire a separate mechanical electrical plumbing engineer, you can do that, but you still have to give them the same information. So what you would do in turn is give that MEP engineer that same manual of equipment based off what you decide you want to do in your building, give them that manual, and then they will do the design and put it on a set of drawings so that you can then go out and bid it to mechanical electrical plumbing contractors. So it's an option you have of how you want to do that. And again, if you have good relationships with contractors in your area, they can help assist you through that process, but they can't do anything until you answer the questions I faced you with today. Uh, will you need an architect? In most states and jurisdictions, you will need an architect. Um, you know, even if this is on trust land and you have your own uh, code official and your own set of codes, you really want an architect to help you through at least the life safety systems of that building, you know, to help you ensure that you're meeting the fire sprinkler requirements, the number of exits in the building, uh, your restrooms are designed properly, um, you know, all these kind of things that you just want to make sure you have a safe building. So. I do recommend to hire an architect, at least for a portion of that work. You don't necessarily have to hire one to do a turnkey operation because that architect more than likely is not going to know any more than you did about your processing facility. They can draw it for you and they can help you coordinate it if you need that help. Uh, uh, but more than likely you won't find an architect in your area that's going to know about processing plants specifically. So. Uh, another question that was on the structure of should it be a wood structure or steel structure? That's something you have to analyze. Uh, wood structures are combustible. So think about that. Wood structures will be a little bit cheaper, um, but temperature changes, humidity, moisture, uh, fire, all these things affect uh, a wood structure more adversely than they do a steel structure. So we chose steel in our area. Um, another thing you think about is your finished product. How does your finished product get stored? How long are you going to store it? How much are you going to store? Uh, if you're going to store all your customer products or all of your own product in a finished cooler or finished freezer, you have to design space for that to happen. In. So, you know, if you're, if you're going to do processing for customers and make them get it within seven days, you can take the number of harvests that you're going to do each week and calculate that into the amount of storage you need. Um, you know, basically you want to plan for a week's worth of storage or two weeks worth of storage. Uh, but if you're going to have your own product in that cooler or freezer and you're going to sell out of that cooler or freezer, you might need more storage. So again, you need to think about that and uh, you'll figure out how much space you need. Um, you know, some of the other things, once you figure out what you're going to do in the building, that all translates into building plans, floor plans, and more importantly, food safety plans and HACCP plans. Uh, you have to have a HACCP plan before you're going to get a uh, certificate of inspection uh, from USDA, but you can't build a HACCP plan until you answer all the questions I gave you today. Uh, you know, it's, it's unfortunate this week we had a, we had a great loss. We had a, we had a good friend named Paul Darby that helped us through our HACCP plans and our, and our food safety plans. And uh, Paul passed away this past Sunday and, you know, our thoughts and prayers are with his family. But I know as well, Paul was helping a few other tribes across the United States and 
Paul's a great man, and, and we, we all suffered a great loss by losing Paul. Um, but, you know, Janie, I know, and, and, and Zach, we're all working together to help fill that void. Um, so we have some great resources for food safety plans and HACCP plans. Uh, but you cannot even start those plans until you know what you're going to do in this building or how you're going to do it or what you're going to do with it. So you have to answer all these questions before you can start the, the remainder of the plans. So the intent of this was to kick, kick start your thinking process of what I'm going to do, how I'm going to do it, and how much space I need. And then uh, I've already talked to Zach and Janie. We, we, we want to have some follow-up sessions uh, and webinars that we can continue to build on this process. So we want Chris, to give you all a little bit of time. Yes, ma'am. We're going we're gonna to give them enough to have their heads just, you know, spinning <laughs> around. Uh, but it is a process. And I think uh, at NAF, we're, we're committed to the process. I know IC is. I know Chris is. Um, uh, we, I remember vividly, Chris, coming on site and the building was pretty much, it was almost built pretty much. And Paul was there and, but we brought in some HACCP trainers. Do you remember them? Absolutely. And there's a we still couple use them. Of, yeah, they're really great. Uh, but there are resources out there. There's a, there's a team of folks that are extremely highly respected that worked with Pawpaw that will come on site and actually do HACCP training for your entire team. And that's what we did at Quapaw. And it was, it was arduous and it was, you know, several days long and it, it was a slog, <laughs> but you have to do it. And because those HACCP plans are critical to you getting fully inspected by FSIS, they're the documents against which, um, you know, the federal government keeps you federally inspected, right, Chris? And, the, That's and, right. and That's every right. single page has details that are really important for you to, you know, understand fully and your staff to understand fully. So I would share with you that I, I think it's not too early in any process. I know Chris might differ with me on this a little bit, but the <laughs> sooner you can identify, if you're really serious about this, the sooner you can identify folks at your tribe who are willing to take the plunge with you uh, willing to become certified in these skills, willing to understand how the HACCP plans processes uh, function. Um, those are what keeps the door open after you open it. Um, and right. so the sooner you can get those folks identified who are, who are ready to make this a career for themselves, the better, because they can go ahead and start being really in, uh, introduced to all the concepts that are built into these plans that there are people out there that we know, that I know have known for years and that we can pull in and, and actually point folks in the right directions. Yeah. You know, there's multiple types of plants. I, you know, I have one question I can see here about a, a, a micro plant. You know, I'm not exactly sure of your definition of a micro plant. Um, uh, you might want to elaborate a little bit more on that. If you just are just talking about a small facility to do harvest and packaging, uh, again, that's just one concept that we've, we've been uh, approached about as well. Uh, we hear a lot of people talk about mobile processing plants. That's a completely different animal. Um, you know, there's been a lot of issues about that on inspection and how you maintain inspection and, are, and how you can resell that product under mobile processing facilities. So uh, that's, that's an interesting subject that, you know, we can continue to, to dump into. And I don't claim to be an expert at meat processing by any means, uh, but you know we are willing to share what we have, uh, what we've done, mistakes along the way. Um, you know, there's a lot of concepts I know are being talked about. A lot of folks are talking about standalone plants uh, in different capacities. You know, I know uh, I've heard a few different groups talk about co-ops and trying to get different regions to pool together and build one plant. We've also got another group that's talking about. Uh, and Janie and I've talked about it briefly, but you know, the, the, there's plants available that you can buy space or buy interest in. Uh, if you want to have a share of that plant to secure uh, processing space or process or hang space in that facility, uh, you know, there's a lot of different uh, options out there. Uh, so if you don't think you're suited to own and operate your own plant, there are other options uh, available. So 
some of you may not uh, have the desire to own and staff and operate a plant daily and it's a lot of work I can tell you so you want to be careful do your homework uh, investigate everything you possibly can before you start spending money and breaking ground on a new building so is there more questions Matthew we need to address yeah we have one here um, Leah like to ask if the our facility competes with um, the, the major large-scale processors in terms of the price of product and um, if they're relatable in terms of the market you know it, that's a t that's a good question uh, the uh, you know the large processors you know the IBP Smithfields National Beefs all the big processors they 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 kind of control the market and and you know these small plants are not meant to compete with those large plants you know we're intending to control our supply uh, you cannot compete with the box beef market and you should not necessarily try to but what you can control is the quality of your product you can control you know the supply chain in your communities you can control where your animals go and when they go uh, so a lot of a lot of positives to the whole farm to plate type uh, situations that are there in the farm to market so you, you've got to look at that, uh, the success side of the small and medium-sized processors. A lot of good value in those processors. And I think uh, one more underlying question that a lot of people have been asking is basically asking about the bare minimum in terms of requirements, especially with the regards to the term a micro plant. So in terms of there, staff, staff numbers and budgets and all the different things. You know, there's some there. small custom there's some small custom plants that can run with three or four people. That's under custom operation. They do, you know, a handful of animals every week. So that's where you really have to identify what you are trying to accomplish. If you just want to process a handful of animals each week, it can be a small facility with just a few people. You still have to have refrigeration and freezers and, and all those kind of things. You got to be able to hold animals, but that all depends on the numbers that you're trying to do. And then the inspection type that you're trying to do really makes a difference. Uh, you know, the types of equipment, the space requirements you need. Um, so if you're only trying to provide your family or your community or your, your tribal area solely, you know, you can, you can look at the small plants and, and, and probably get by. Great, great. Well, I think that covers just about everything that we need. I know we have a lot of other questions coming in with regards to uh, feeding facilities and a lot of things that are involved pre, pre slaughter. So uh, yeah, I think Chris, Chris, if you want to maybe raise your hand now to volunteer to put together <laughs> another, <laughs> another webinar with regards to feeding oh, no, facilities. I couldn't do it without Matthew. Background. You know, there, there are, let, let me skim a few of these questions. Uh, uh, there's one more. As you were designing, you have the harvest and packing in the same building. What were your thoughts around one facility versus two facilities? Uh, if you're doing harvesting, I don't think you could split up harvesting and packing at all. Uh, if you're harvesting in this facility, you have to be able to put it in some kind of package before it can leave this facility. So harvesting and packing really go together. Uh, I would not try to separate those two. Um, if you wanted to separate further processing possibly, uh, you might be able to, you know, separate further processing or added value, but, but it would have to change. It would have to change facilities in a package sealed uh, under inspection, so to speak. Uh, so you, you really got to think about that. Um, let me give my email as well. Uh, there's folks that I know would like to have our video uh, and if some of the questions that we may not have gotten to today. If you want to email me those questions, I will get you an answer. Um, and then we will work on um, setting up another webinar, I think, to dive deeper into this and maybe based on some of the questions we get over the next few days. Um, but working with Janie and Zach and some of the other organizations, uh, you know, we wanted to try to keep the Intertribal Ag Council as the platform for this so that we can continue to give you free information. Uh, you know, there's a lot of resources available to you for free, and we want to make sure you're getting all you can before you even have to go pay consultants to do some of this for you. There are consultants that'll try to go out and get this information for you, but 
uh, again, we'll, we'll try to give you all we can, uh, you know, at no, at no cost to you. So my email is croper, C-R-O-P-E-R, at quapawservices.com. That's Q-U-A-P-A-W-S-E-R-V-I-C-E-S.com. So feel free to email me at any time. If I didn't get to your question, email it to me and I will respond. Um, so uh, I'm happy to you know, continue or do whatever you think we need to do, Matthew. All right. Sounds good. Well, with that being said, thank you all so much for jumping on. Uh, please uh, answer that exit poll on your way out. And uh, we'd love seeing your interactions and seeing your numbers. But be sure to join us next week. We'll have our friends with us from the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative. They will be um, helping us through all the regulatory processes, all the legalities when it comes to building a processing plant, food safety plans, the laws, everything that's within that realm. And I know that's going to be an entirely uh, new conversation for many of you, but we certainly do hope that you join us next week. So with that being said, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Janie, if thank you can you hear all. us there in the room. And uh, we'll conclude with that. Thank you all. See you next time. Thank you all. Appreciate your time. We're all done, Janie. Thank you for jumping on. Hey, we need to do about 10 of these. We do, I know there's, there's so much information to share. And if you don't mind, I shared your email there in the chat with everybody yes. so they can reach out yeah, to you. Let's, let's, I'm on another webinar now, but uh, let's plan the next one because uh, I'm happy for NAF to partner with y'all to get more of these out there. There's too much to talk about in one setting. Yes, ma'am. I fully agree. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Yeah. Mm -hmm.